Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Next Generation Credentials, Rethinking the High School Diploma. We are delighted that you are here. I'm Lori Gagnau. I'm the Competency Works Program Director at the Aurora Institute. And we have a great um, group of panelists today. So a little bit about the Aurora Institute. Um, this, this webinar today and the report on which it's based on is a great example of how we enact our mission by building knowledge in the field around competency-based education and transformative practices and how we support policy to get to a different place in education. And so we we really um, do this through sharing sharing information, doing research, telling the stories of the field um, through practice policy and research. And we're um, really excited to be able to share with you today. So I welcome you to, if people are already doing this, introducing yourself in the, in the chat box, um, feel free to share your role, your location, um, why you joined today. Um, I am joining from Somerville, Massachusetts myself, and we welcome you to participate actively throughout the webinar. Um, we'll use the chat as people are doing now to introduce themselves, but use that for general thoughts and engagement. We'll drop some links in there throughout that are relevant that you may want to check out. Um, yeah, feel free to engage with each other. And then for any kind of questions that you want us to formally answer, um, please use the Q&A button that you'll find. Um, and so in the latter half of the webinar, we'll, we'll really be engaging in a discussion. Um, so please ask questions um, through for the panelists through the Q&A button. And we invite you to share your thoughts on X, formerly Twitter, um, or other social media um, that you are part of and please tag the Aurora Institute. And we are recording today and you'll be able to access the slides and the recording later, as well as some of the key uh, resources that we'll be sharing. So let's get started. Um, this webinar um, is really, you know, this reflecting on the on where we're at and where are some of the flaws in our system. So if we think of a transcript, a typical student walks away from their K-12 education with a high school transcript, a laundry list of all the courses they took in high school and the grades they earned in those classes. But these static documents don't really tell us um, the full breadth of what a student knows and is able to do upon leaving high school. And they're not really that helpful for um, knowing um, what you need to learn next and how to pursue you know, the career, your careers of your choice and post-secondary learning. And our new world of work and learning de demands not just academic knowledge, but also skills that are transferable, such as communications and creativity, collaboration skills, that are even if they're taught are rarely captured formally um, in our, our transcript system. So our mainstream transcripts aren't really telling us how well students are prepared uh, and in what ways. If we wanna effectively capture um, what an individual knows and is able to do over their lifetime, um, it, it requires a lot more. And we have a lot more resources and ideas on how to actually communicate and capture that information now. We know that every learner is going to take their own path in their life. Um, and so, and that doesn't um, start only after high school, and it certainly doesn't end when you finish K-12. So each student's journey is unique, and we now need to think about how do we help students learn um, how to learn, learn how to navigate and make choices about the pathway that they're taking. And when we open up learning beyond the walls of the classrooms to internships, to community projects, to um, early college, um, then we, we want to be able to capture that. And there's a whole world of possibilities for learners to develop um, new skills and deeper levels of expertise on foundational skills in areas that they're really interested. So we're exploring this concept of how do you kind of bring all that information into a new kind of credential and a new kind of learning experience. And these next, the idea of next generation credentials is that this is a key part of moving towards a fully um, realized competency-based system. 
um, a new type of system that grows and adapts as the learner progresses, that accurately reports and communicates how young people are building those knowledge and skills. And most importantly, it's known and it's useful to the learner themselves. Our new report, Going Beyond the Traditional, Next-Gen Credentials and Flexible Learning Pathways, is really seeking to deepen state policymakers' understanding of the changes that are needed to facilitate meaningful next-gen credentials and to advance state policy to support those changes. There are three um, key areas of recommendations, both investing in developing next-gen credentials, creating the competency frameworks and competency-based education systems that enable meaningful um, and valid reporting um, and jet populating of those credentials, and then to build the capacity and infrastructure in K-12 and in, in among all stakeholders to really utilize and um, create the experience, um, both um, K-12 into higher education and into the workforce and industry development. So that each um, at each level, the information about what learners know and can do is available um, for the purposes um, of at each level of that system. Um, and that employers and admissions um, officers for higher education um, are in, in dialogue with students um, through their, their learning and employment records. Today, we're gonna to hear from um, education innovators from the International Big Picture Learning Credential and the state of Vermont about how they're creating breakthrough models to transform how we document and validate learning both inside and outside of the classroom. In the larger report, we also feature some other um, examples of leaders, including the Mastery Transcript Consortium and um, New Zealand, as well as the state leadership um, in Utah and North Dakota. So there's lots to explore in the full report. And today we'll dig into these key examples. Our first um, panelist is Andrea Purcell, uh, Program Director at the Big Picture Learning um, and she's leading the expansion and piloting of the International Big Picture Learning Credential, which originated in Australia, um, and she is leading the work to bring it into the United States. Um, the I'm really excited that we can feature the IBPCL um, today. It it is one of the it is truly reimagining what an end of high school credential could be um, if it wasn't. Um, what we know as just a traditional high school diploma and transcript. So uh, Andrea, um, turn it Thanks, over Lori. to you. Thank you for the introduction. And um, want to start with um, some gratitude to you, Lori, and to the Aurora Institute for convening um, this group together. I was sort of following the chat a little bit and seeing where folks are coming from. And it's um, such a pleasure to be speaking about an international credential to such an international audience. I saw folks coming in from Mexico and from South Africa. And um, I know we have our, um, our CEO of Big Picture Learning in Australia, Viv White, on the call. And I saw some other Australian contacts. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the scale, uh, the global scale and potential for the um, IBPLC. Uh, throughout this time together. Uh, before I forget, I just wanted to drop my um, my email address in the chat so that folks know how to contact me if you want to do any personal outreach afterwards. I'm happy to um, answer questions or to arrange a time to talk to you about anything that triggers your imagination um, or your thinking. Um, I think we know because we've been doing this, these Zoom things and conference things for a bit now, um, part of the learning that I have and part of why I appreciate being invited to such a, a space is the prep work. Um, and I really have been grateful to be able to talk to Jess um, and to the students, to Peyton and Ella, um, to Pat, to hear a little bit about the work that's happening. I'm geographically located in Los Angeles, so across the United States and Vermont. Um, to see how we can sort of come at this work of com competency and proficiency-based education um, it, in our respective work, but as a collaborative. Um, and one of the things that came up in our prep was this um, talk about uh, policy to practice. And I kind of want to take 
this part of the presentation from the other direction and talk about practice to policy, because that's the way that um, we have always kind of done business and big picture learning. And it's really the way that the international big picture learning credential was developed um, by our colleagues at Big Picture Australia under the direction of Viv White. So, um, you know, the IBPLC is really grounded on over 30 years of practice and work in alternative forms of documenting and setting up experiences for student learning through big picture learning. So the big picture learning goals and outcomes are not new. Those have been um, in play in our schools uh, around the world um, for about 30 years now. And we have evidence that the orientation of student experiences and learning toward those uh, learning goals um, is really impactful and effective in preparing students post-secondary for both the workforce and post-secondary higher education um, opportunities. So the, the theory and sort of like the foundation upon which the credential has been developed and built has been tested. The outcomes and the goals are, are not new. What Viv gave us and her team at Big Picture Australia is a way of documenting and communicating um, the student progress around within the frame of the Big Picture learning goals um, in a really powerful and easily presentable way. Um, so that's what uh, the, the work is. And Viv and her team have been piloting the IBPLC in collaboration and partnership with the University of Melbourne um, for about six years now. Viv, you can correct me in the chat if I'm understating that at all. Uh, and in the United States, we have been working on a pilot that we just completed the second year of. Um, our advisor, who we're going to Lenny, who we're going to introduce in just a minute, was part of the pilot group, um, and he just took a, his cohort through the first round of full credentials. Um, let me tell you really briefly what that means. So what you're looking at here is a dashboard presentation of the IBPLC, and you'll see kind of the what we call the flower. That's a visual graphic representation of a whole lot of information that. Um, lies behind the flower. This is student accomplishments um, in the areas of the six uh, big picture learning goals, personal qualities, quantitative reasoning, empirical reasoning, communication, social reasoning, and knowing how to learn. Um, and this shows on a, on a one through five progression scale um, how a student has demonstrated um, through doing their, their knowledge and capacity, their competency in these areas. Um, the other components that are critical to sort of note about the dashboard presentation of the credential is that you see um, that there's a, a video statement, a link to a video statement, so you can hear a student introduce him or herself in their own voice. Um, there's an advisor statement in the lower left-hand uh, corner that is a short biographical statement, kind of a proxy to a letter of rec recommendation that you might get from somebody. Um, there's also a link to a digital online portfolio um, that uh, um, can show you the work behind the, um, the flower and sort of the evaluations there. And then we've got like a mini brag sheet kind of in the lower right hand corner that shows the accomplishments that students want to list and want to highlight. Um, I want to emphasize that the flower is created um, with psychometric evaluation and warranting. There's actually frames behind each one of the six learning goals um, that help guide discussions and, and guide the evaluation, what we call moderations. Um, there are three moderations in the junior and senior year um, in order to get to a full credential in order to produce the flower. Um, and on those, there's, for lack of a better term, we call them frames. It looks like a rubric uh, behind each one of these. And there are a minimum of three sources of evidence with approximately eight points of data per source of evidence that produce um, the, the flower. And so I, I think it's important to understand what's behind this in order to kind of uh, know what's being shown um, here on the dashboard. Um, but we are really grateful to Viv and her team for creating such an easily um, readable, um, an easily readable dashboard that helps sort of to convey the complexity of student learning that happens both in school, but also allows us to capture sort of non-traditional um, uh, learning environments um, outside of the, um, the school setting. Um, and in our case, often that takes the, the um, form of internships. 
So there's lots more to say about this, um, but I wanted you folks to also be able to hear from somebody who's been on the ground um, and implementing this um, in the United States from the beginning of the pilot. So this is um, Lenny Op Opedisano. Um, he has been an advisor at Lafayette Big Picture in Syracuse, New York for 16 years. Sorry, we can advance past that slide. Um, I can talk about the scaling later. Um, and uh, Lenny has uh, been awarded the advisor of the year for big picture learning. He was a founding advisor there in Lafayette. Um, and I know I have learned a ton from him about his attempts uh, of putting the IBPLC into practice in a US uh, context. So Lenny, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'll get right into it. So yes, uh, Lafayette, uh, big picture has been, um, you know, in play for uh, this is our 16th year, and uh, so we've we've always used the learning goals. Um, but when the IBPLC came to us, uh, we were particularly interested in it because although we've always used the learning goals as a way to, you know, drive rigor in student work, um, we really saw this as a more authentic way to have conversations about the rigor and growth and learning and also to have this built-in evaluation tool. Um, we've always kind of lived, struggled with the identity um, of being a school who wanted students to do this authentic work, but then were um, sometimes forced to refine that into numerical, into numerical grades. Uh, so uh, the you know, IBPLC came to our school, um, we were trained in it. Uh, we had introductions and trainings over the course of a year. Uh, we practiced. We learned more about it. And uh, Tanya, who was training us at one point, she said that thinking of these frames is, and, and this was a huge paradigm shift for me. She said, instead of thinking about how good the student is, let's think about how is the student good? And that really just changed um, how, how I looked at this. So we engage, we learned how to use the frames and we engaged in the work and in our in our uh, one of our rounds of judgments last last winter, um, you know, th these are the these are the, the the takeaways from that. Um, one of the things that we realized was we were we were looking for you know, at least three pieces of evidence for each of the six frames. And if I found myself like really struggling to find a good piece of evidence, then that told me as an educator that maybe I wasn't creating enough learning experiences in that area. Um, QR, for example, quantitative reasoning thinking like a mathematician. So after um, doing a cycle of judgments, uh, we walked away from that and we said, well, you know, we really need to, um, you know, help students incorporate more of that in their project work and look for more opportunities to think like a mathematician. Uh, another example is communication. You know, it's e equatable with English, but it's so much more. And we realized that our students were doing a ton of narrative writing, but not a lot of technical writing. So that was another um, way that it informed us as, as educators to create different experiences for our students. Um, another benefit of the frames is after doing the judgments, it really gave us uh, amazing language to have conversation with students about um, what growth looks like, like what the next level looks like. And the language in the frames is um, perfectly suited for that. Um, so that was that was another takeaway. And then one of my favorite um, parts of the frames, um, one of my favorite frames, if there is a favorite, is the knowing how to learn. Uh, we believe that there are a few things more important um, when a student you know graduates from high school than them understanding themselves as learners and knowing how to continue learning. Um, so that's why I chose the the photo of Jace there. Um, you know, Jace. Uh, came to us and he was obviously really interested in culinary and um, the experiences that Jace had and using the frames and thinking about, you know, knowing how to learn um, just worked perfectly. So our students, you know, they have learning plans, they set goals, um, they have internships. Uh, Jace had an internship at a, at a local cafe where he could learn skills from somebody who runs, you know, a restaurant. And um, then he, you know, obviously a lot of students learn from searching the internet for things. And in this example, he's doing probably his third or fourth attempt at creating lo mein noodles, where he made the dough from scratch, 
Um, but the process was more than that. You know, he he ate lo mein noodles at a restaurant and got interested in it. He he asked people how to how to make them. He was working with one of our staff members and one of another culinary student there. And they're 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 trying different things, they're evaluating um their success and they're um they're they're making it. Uh and he ended up making um lo mein at his exhibition and then uh catering our senior thesis project event. So the the students these days um you know learn in very different ways, obviously. And for Jace, he he got a lot of his um you know input from TikTok videos and, and other social media. And this was a way for us to evaluate that and say, let's let's talk to experts, let's refine our technique, let's experiment, let's try different things. Um, so uh, that's that's just one small example of how we've used the frames to drive rigor and um, enhance the student learning experience. Um, I think the frames provide a richer and more relevant educational experience with a lot more potential for growth um, than a traditional transcript. And uh, I think that the learners and graduates are better equipped to be successful in college and their careers. Um, and so currently our students are graduating with both the IB PLC credential and a traditional transcript. And we hope that, that, um, that there's potential for change in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andrea and Lenny. Um, the innovation of the IBPCL um, is inspiring, right? And it's really based in big, big picture learnings, real world personalized model. A uh, question that many people have is how, what does it, what does it mean to make this shift from a more traditional school model? And we're going to delve into that question um, as well. Um, so Jess DeCarolis is the director of student, the student pathways division at the Vermont Agency of Education. And she's going to share how Vermont has laid the groundwork for proficiency-based learning systems and graduation requirements. Um, so I will turn it. Um, over to Jess. Great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lori. And, and I want to echo my thanks to the Aurora Institute. And I, I do appreciate following uh, Lenny and uh, Andrea because there's uh, this practice to policy. And I think Vermont um, can highlight the policy component. But I will say that we really, this was a policy pathway probably beginning in 2002, truly informed by practice in the field and trying to elevate it up. So our introduction to student-centered learning in Vermont is somewhat outlined in the report, which is we're very appreciative, but really came with landmark legislation in the passage of Act 77, which was a flexible pathways initiative and the adoption of the education quality standards in 2004, um, which really signaled both an expectation and requirement for uh, personalized learning planning process and flexible pathways, which was really outlined in, in the, the act as well as a codification of those expectations within our rules, which both included uh, personal learning plans, flexible pathways, but also uh, this, this concept of graduation requirements that were based on uh, evidence and demonstration of proficiency in local graduation requirements, which articulated that schools could use credits, but they could not base those credits based on seat time. They had to be uh, they had to specify specific proficiencies and the demonstration of those proficiencies. And um, because we were very vision heavy, uh, all of this was to begin in, in 2014 with full implementation in 2020. So while Vermont was very strong and has always been strong on vision and did invest in flexible pathway opportunities for students, um, this type of paradigm shift in a hyper-local control state um, probably needed a little bit more focus and investment in implementation. And so as an end result, what we found is our state sample graduation requirements, really, and you can see those on our website, and there's there's hyperlinks to all of these pieces. And my colleague, Pat Fitzsimmons, which many of you might know, um, is also going to drop links as we go through this. We, we ended up with 47 graduation proficiencies in our sample proficiencies, and uh, based on a 2019 survey, sticks to 135 graduation proficiencies at the local level. And when you're thinking about equity and you're thinking about um, 
you know, coherence, this, this really was uh, highlighting for us that we had a bit of an implementation gap. So we did, and we can advance to the next slide. We, we did begin this process to address the implementation gap in 2017. It was a two year process led by my colleague, Pat Fitzsimmons, um, to engage in stakeholder input to develop a portrait of a graduate. So again, over the uh, two year process, over 300 students, educators and education stakeholders participated in developing not only this portrait of a graduate and the, the central attributes, um, but also to engage in identifying what are those indicators of those attributes. And so on the next slide, this is a sample of the work of the field, um, which uh, because it began in 2017 and was posted in 2019 is, is probably going to be undergoing an update as part of uh, work that we're, we're engaged in now that I'll be explaining. But really it, it identified six attributes uh, each of those attributes with three indicators or key performance indicators uh, for to support schools in thinking about what is our destination and what is our guarantee to Vermont students and families. In addition to trying to define the destination in an attempt to get to coherence, we also wanted to start to pull together the roadmap. So on the next slide, we're, this is a visualization, but really it represents a series of frameworks that we've been developing or have developed that integrate various components of education quality standards, which again are referenced in the report around expectations around local comprehensive assessment systems, MTSS, uh, articulating how students can engage in flexible uh, learning opportunities, et cetera. So we wanted to not only say, here's the destination, but how do we take all of these pieces all of this new set of requirements, regulation, and, and legislation that we were asking you to implement immediately and try to pull it together into a, a, a story, a narrative, a common process by which we have some opportunity to frame that people can build off of while still preserving that flexibility at the local level. Um, we also uh, wanted to ensure that student-centered learning while we, we talk about the personalized learning uh, process, that student-centered learning is uh, central and informed by students. And so in thinking about a, a roadmap to a destination, throughout these pieces, ensuring that we are having students inform the process for designing assessments, inform process for planning for proficiency. And we're, we're going to hear from a couple of students shortly. Next slide. Um, Another powerful insight, and this is something that came um, out of the pandemic uh, as an opportunity for coherence, is that we found that in the legislation and regulation, there was a very clear line beginning in grade seven around personalization and proficiency. And what that meant is we discovered not all educators saw their role in, in uh, helping students to meet that destination when it comes to proficiency-based graduation requirements. So what the team has been focused on for the last three years is really through a participatory action research process in which we are elbow to elbow with educators embedded in districts is working to refine those uh, proficiency-based graduation requirements to get to some coherence to limit the, uh, the vast uh, spectrum of six to 135, but also to make sure that every educator sees themselves in this roadmap to that portrait of a graduate. And so we've created some new language, including this idea of critical proficiencies that then can inform graduation-based, uh, proficiency-based graduation requirements. And within each of those, making sure that we're identifying priority performance indicators. Next slide. So here's an example. And again, we have um, a, a hyperlink in this uh, slideshow to additional resources and supports on the website. Um, but here's an example of how we are trying to define that hierarchy and particularly this idea of, of new vocabulary and this concept of content literacies. Within the regulation, while each SUSD or supervisory union, supervisory district is responsible for developing those proficiency-based graduation requirements, they are tied to curriculum content and the minimum course of study as outlined in law. So those are state adopted standards. So here, what we've been doing is trying to create 
a statement of a particular content literacy, and then identifying those critical proficiencies that inform a student having that content literacy, understanding that in the real world, connected literacies, we are frequently using those competencies, those literacies in combination in order to solve problems. Next slide. And then finally, uh, we also want to make sure that we were being as explicit as possible in identifying connections between content literacies. And then we also have transferable skills. And both of those have informed those essential attributes of a portrait of a graduate. And so developing a series of making connections documents that show both, and again, this is just a sort of the hood, but there's an engine underneath of, of other supporting documents of, of making that connection between both what are those content literacies and what is that proficiency, but also how does it inform the different attributes of a portrait of a graduate? So that's that's our, our quick snapshot. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Ella and Peyton, um, or to Lori who can introduce Ella and Peyton. Thanks so much, um, Jess. And that really just paints the picture of all of the groundwork that is necessary to get to a different kind of reporting um, in transcripts. So we're really grateful to have two students from Bellows Free Academy Fair Fairfax in Vermont to share their experience firsthand. So in 2016 to 2017 school year, BFA transitioned to proficiency B based grading and reporting so that the freshmen of that year would graduate four years later in 2020 with the proficiency based diploma. And um, this is the system that um, Peyton and Ella came into. So there's lots of practical resources that are here and we'll make sure that they're available in the follow up. Um, but today we're going to hear um, from Peyton Mitrick and Ella Farone about what this is like, what proficiency-based learning and graduation requirements look like for this for students um, themselves. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Ella and Peyton. Um, hi, my name is Ella, and I'm currently a junior at BFA Fairfax. And I'm Peyton. I'm a senior at BFA Fairfax. So like Lori said, our school has been using proficiencies since the fall of 2016. So if my math is correct, Ella and I would have been in third and fourth grade at that point. So proficiency-based grading is essentially all we've known as a grading system. So we're hopefully going to help you understand a little bit more how students are using proficiencies every day and how we use them to guide our approach to our learning. So Ella's gonna start us off by talking a little bit about PowerSchool, which is the grading program we use, and then move into where we see our proficiencies on our report cards. And then I'll talk a little bit about how that translates to a transcript and graduation with distinction, which is a unique way that we celebrate and recognize our seniors at BFA. I know me personally, um, I check my grades every day and I'm sure Peyton does too. Do. We check them through PowerSchool and PowerSchool shows us individual assignment grades and our standard grades for the class. We don't have a picture of our assignment grades, but when we look at them, we are being graded on academic proficiencies. If we aren't happy with the grade, we can always reassess with teachers. Most teachers are very willing to help you reassess as they really wanna see you succeed and improve. Right now, what you are looking at are standard grades for a student's AP Calculus class. Standard grades are the grades we receive, which average our successes in each of our classes, and they show us how successful we are within each proficiency. Um, this is at the top of the grades. There are math proficiencies for advanced coursework, and towards the bottom are standards, um, standards transferable skills grades for proficiencies. Um, and if we're worried about how good our grades will be at the end of the trimester, we can check them and work on the specific targets that are needed in, for the most help. Um, at the end of each trimester, we receive report cards, um, and they reflect our successes and improvements in each class throughout the trimester. Um, right now, you are looking at the math section of proficiencies for a student's pre-calculus -cal pre class on a report card. Could you go to the next slide? Thank you. <laughs> um, demonstrated in their averages and in the green of the proficiency bar on the right, the student is excelling with a 3.6 in geometry, whereas under algebra, they have a three and interpret and manipulate the structure of expressions, meaning this student is proficient. If they are trying to accomplish getting it extended in the class, they may want to work on algebra and the proficiency targets help make goals and help personalize their learning so they can succeed. The next section of the report card is about transferable skills. Transferable skills are skills we are 
assessed on with academic assignments that not only improve our academic knowledge, but also help build skills that we can apply to our everyday lives. There are five main transferable skills, communication, self-direction, informed and integrative thinking, problem solving, and responsible and involved citizenship. Report cards are a very important way to see our progress and accomplishments over the years. Through academics and transferable skills, proficiencies allow us to view our grades as goals and accomplishments, and they are a promising way for us to succeed. Awesome, yeah. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about our transcripts, which are on the next slide. Um, there are three kind of distinct sections of our transcript. You can't see all of them right now, but if you want to see the full example, that's the second link on our resources slide. Um, but the section that we're looking at here tends to be what students are looking at the most. So here we see each year the content that the student was assessed on, so the courses that they took and their average proficiency level for each content area. And this allows students to see a full picture of their learning over their four years. This is a student who is a senior, so it doesn't have their senior year classes yet, but their junior year you can see, sophomore and freshman. And this allows us to compare yearly content proficiencies and see where students have grown, where there might be some room for improvement, which can really impact the goals that we set. Um, but more importantly, I want to talk about graduation with distinction, which is how we recognize our students for their hard work in various areas of study. So on the screen, you can see the descriptions right now of the six sections of distinction that we have at BFA. So that's arts, STEM, humanities, leadership, career readiness, and renaissance. Each section requires that students are working really, really hard. So they're taking rigorous coursework, they are engaging in their community, and they're dedicating themselves both inside and out of, outside of the classroom to that area of study. The goal of earning distinction is something that overshadows students' learning throughout their entire high school career, if that's something they're working towards. And it really encourages them to think about what classes they're taking, how that fits into their goals, and what steps they need to take outside of the classroom to earn distinction in the area they choose. This really encourages students to take a very considerate and approach, thoughtful approach to their learning over their high school career. And I know for me, this is something that I've put a lot of consideration into when I'm planning my course load and my activities for the year and figuring out my, what my goals are for each class is. We don't do traditional class rank at our school, and instead we do graduation with distinction, which I feel represents a more whole student and their work. It isn't just the top, top students that are being recognized for their good grades and hard work. It's a bunch of students that are being recognized for taking rigorous coursework every year, challenging themselves, and being really engaged in their community. And that is all we have. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone um, for introducing us to your work and experience. Um, I know we've only scratched uh, the surface probably for in all these cases, um, in, in, but in what, the, what it means to use and create and lay the groundwork in policy and practice for next gen credentials. We're now going to shift to discussion. I invite all our panelists to uh, turn their video on. We've got a few um, Q&A questions and we've got a few prepared questions. So if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A function. Um, and I'm going to stop our slides so that we can see everybody. Um, panelists, you're welcome to turn on your um, videos and let's get started. Um, Ellen Payton, we're going to start with you. We often hear concerns in the field um, that competency-based transcripts could hurt students when they apply to college or they com or compete for scholarships. Um, do you or your families share these concerns or not? And how prepared do you feel to, as you're making plans for your own futures? That's a great question. Um, I'm really not concerned about it. I've been on quite a few college stores at this point. And almost every school that I've been to has made it really clear that competency-based scores, proficiency-based grading isn't going to hurt my chances at the school because the schools want to know what your learning is in the context of your school. So we have a school profile that goes along with our transcript that explains how our proficiencies translate to traditional learning scales and also just what that means for students in general. Um, so no, I think that schools are really understanding and encouraging of these different proficiency-based grading and competency-based grading systems. I mean, I'm also really not worried about it. I mean, I have a ton of friends who have already gotten into colleges that have graduated from our school with proficiency grading, and they're all very successful now. I mean, I know for me, I'm pretty confident going into college tours and college applications, and I know that our guidance has a way that they can calculate our GPA using proficiency grading, though I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> okay. um, and there's a question here about um, how how do you 
received graduation with distinct, distinction in the different areas. Um, can you say a little bit more about how the courses are identified, where you get to make your own choices to propose how you're going to pursue one of those areas of distinction? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I like to think about the STEM proficiency as I think that one probably has the most, um, I guess, opportunity for choice. So in each of those distinctions, there are a certain level of courses you have to take. So the STEM distinction requires that you take some sort of advanced or AP STEM courses throughout high school. And that can be college level courses, APs, advanced. But it also the choice comes in where you're picking which classes those are first of all, but the involvement in your community. So for example, I'm working towards the STEM distinction right now. And I did the M3 math modeling challenge, which is a 14 hour consecutive math challenge. And that is my activity that will get me that distinction. I also have friends that are working towards the distinction and are participating in our farm to school program. So it's really whatever you want to make of it. It's just focusing on the fact that you're challenging yourself inside and outside the classroom and you're engaging in your community in that area of study. Great, thank you so much. Um, Lenny, um, as an advisor who supported some of the, the first students pursuing the IBPCL in the US, um, what can you share about the reactions and the feedback from the students and their families about engaging in this really different, right? Both of these are right shifting what the learning um, really means. Um, so what was inspiring, what was scary um, about something? And I know that you said that they're getting both the credential and a traditional transcript. Um, so maybe it's less scary when you have both. Um, but if you could speak a little bit about this first, the, the, the pioneers of the IBPCL in the US, that would be wonderful. Sure, yeah. So um, when I spoke to my students um, about you know this um, being utilized, uh, some of them were apprehensive because they were afraid it was going to be a lot more work. And uh, we kept saying, well, no, this isn't something else on your plate. This is the plate. Um, so, you know, this is these this is really going to just help us, um, you know, reach the reach the finish line and and hit the target. Um, so they, they quickly saw that that was the case. And um, I was just thinking about Jace, um, you know, when he would make food. Um, he would ask he would share it with people and ask how, you know, and, and people would say, oh, it was good or bad or whatever. But like going from a level one in the knowing how to learn frame to a level two goes from like just accepting feedback to actively seeking feedback. So for Jace, it was just a conversation where I said, well, how, how could we find out how everybody thinks? Oh, we do a survey. Okay. You know, something of that nature. So I I think in practice, it wasn't a stretch at all for the students. It, it really just was um, having, a, having the clear language um, and something something to reach for. And because we do exhibitions, uh, you know, parents were part of these conversations because they come into the school for the exhibitions. Um, and so I don't think it was uh, too much of a, a a big shift or a transition for them or, or scary at all. So. Great, both all of you are very reassuring for anyone who's like hesitating, right? The the power of actually share, having students talk about their learning and make choices, in fact, is really inspiring, exciting for everyone. Um, and that really is the origins, right, of big picture learning as a model. And now the um, IBPLC growing out of that um, is finding this way to show uh, internships um, and learning beyond the classroom. Um, and helping learners figure out their own pathways. So Andrea, could you share um, from from big picture learning perspective, you know, what are the lessons, especially around assessment um, that you hope the broader field can learn from the IBPLC? Sure, I think what Lenny is uh, illustrating from his um, his professional experience is that, you know, we know assessment is is and assessment systems are incredibly impactful in terms of, giving us both sort of the liberty and the freedom, but also driving the experiences that we construct for, for our learners. Um, the outcomes that we are oriented toward um, are really the things that we as educators wanna help prepare our students to um, be successful 
in. And so, you know, Lenny's talking about sort of the bi-directional impact or impact potential of evaluation and, and shifting our, our assessment systems. Um, it's impactful both on the practice that happens in the classroom and the experiences that are constructed for students, the way conversations are run, the kinds of questions that educators are asking of students that are really rooted in authentic, real and interest-based um, pursuits and, and interests and, and from a student perspective, but also has the, the potential to show, um, you know, learning to an external audience from a variety of learning environments and using an envir um, a variety of sources of evidence. So it's this, the IBPLC, what, one of the things I love about it is that it's able to capture learning and represent learning um, in sort of non-traditional academic format. So it's not reliant just on text-based sort of classroom generated, assignment generated work. There's an ability to um, document and observe learning that is happening, for example, like I said before, in an internship environment, but also in a lot of other different kinds of learning contexts, because we know that it happens um, anywhere. So it's really putting a, a, a system around what we know is true is that, um, you know, learning happens organically in lots of different contexts, and that this is a way of valuing that learning and representing it um, for the student, um, also in its complexity and not in just a way that's um, disaggregated by content area. It's great. I think there's so much that we are, know about how to do this in a way that's valid and reliable and meaningful and, and has that richness, um, which um, I, I hope is something that um, the field, and of course we've got um, a good group here, um, but we want the, the whole world to know those things. Um, just now thinking about the Vermont uh, context where policy is giving permission um, and inviting educators to change what school looks like and to embrace some of those, um, you know, new innovative assessment policies and create new systems. We know that change takes time. Um, so could you speak a little bit about the ways that Vermont is supporting educators to be able to put the principles of proficiency-based graduation requirements into practice um, and the broader flexible pathways and educational quality standards? And what advice do you have for other states exploring the shifts? Um, are there any um, yeah, are there any um, challenges behind the scenes that you would um, highlight for others that are thinking about um, following Vermont's example? Uh, yeah, absolutely appreciate that. And um, I would say maybe have Peyton and Ella um, just carry them around in my back pocket and whip them out in the legislature. No, um, <laughs> but I do, I do think it's just you know it's it's the power and the promise of competence based or proficiency based learning but I, I think you actually in a set of recommendations one that maybe i'd build off of is the building capacity and infrastructure um and we'll touch on some of the things that we've been doing but within that i think that time you know minimally i, I think having a 10-year strategic plan communicates that this is slow food if you want to do it well and have it sort of stick uh, I, I think too soon we started to get questions about, is it working um, even prior to some of the, the, the deadlines that had been identified in, in legislation and rule. Um, but you have to have realistic imp implementation timelines when you're thinking about uh, particularly local control contexts in which folks might be going about this in a, in a different manner and in which our traditional mechanisms of reporting at the state level are not going to be useful in describing what's happening at the local level. Um, and I, I think part of that also would require that we identify early, and I would recommend uh, this to other states who are in an early stage of this, is really identifying early, where do we need to be tight in order to support coherence and so that we can be loose or flexible in the implementation. Um, there are things that we asked folks at the local level to solve that they couldn't solve or by coming up with uh, local solutions, almost created a Tower of Babel that then created challenges even when students were moving from what like one neighboring town to the next. And so we want to make sure that we can support scale and sustainability by being clear about where to be tight and where, where to be loose. Um, 
I also think that in I belabor this, so I apologize if there's anybody from Vermont who is hearing me say this for the upteenth time, but there has to be state level investment then to support that strategic plan, to support that framing for what's loose or what's tight. What are, do we need to have 35 different reporting systems? I don't know, but it's a question that should be asked at the outset and there should be an investment in coming up with a state perspective, professional learning. Um, stating it alone, uh, declaring a vision, uh, but without the, those wraparound supports is nothing we'd ever do in a classroom and we shouldn't do it at the state level. Uh, and then finally, I would say building it into our accountability system. And, and what I mean by that is communicating that we mean it. <laughs> so in 2000, we built uh, personalization and flexible pathways into our SS state plan. Um, where we know that if if you mean it, you will assess it. Uh, and we wanted to be able to communicate and with the tools that we had at our disposal, that this is this is our value statement. It's not a fad. Um, it wasn't an idea that might change in two years or three years, um, but rather a commitment to what we know works best for for all learners. Um, yeah, and you're hitting upon a, a, a bunch of key pieces, right? This is really um, a whole ecosystem of change. Um, it, it's not just one thing, but it has implications for other all parts of the system. Um, we've got some questions about, you know, standardized assessments and school accountability. Um, we and you know, you can't change everything at once, but you got to be thinking long term about those changes and the systems. Another theme in the questions that I'm seeing um, from audience members is around mindset. Um, so um, Peyton and Ella, maybe I'll start with you, but open it up um, to everyone as well. And I'll welcome you all to uh, ask each other questions um, or look at those Q&A if there's any that you really want to answer. But how, how has the BFA system changed your approach to learning in school in general? Has it changed your mindset of learning? We got a question here um, about... Um, you know, the sort of, we think of traditional as, oh, working to maximize our scores or get the grade, um, you know, has that shifted at all from, um, to be really about the learning, not just about the score or the grade? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've grown as learners, what you do when you struggle or don't get it right the first time, um, and talk about like your own mindset as learners, um, to the extent that, um, you can step back and reflect. Um, I think, I think that it's very different for every student. I'm a huge perfectionist. So sometimes in certain classes, it's really hard for me to remind myself that proficiency based grading isn't just about the score, like numerically of what we're getting. So like, I think I took AP Calc last year. That was a struggle. I am not a math person. So it was a really big challenge for me. And there were some days where I had to really step back and recognize that it wasn't necessarily the number on the test that I was getting out of 100%. It was the fact that I was working really, really hard and I was feeling more confident with things as time went on. So I think it's really, it's really subjective based on each student. I don't think that I'll ever necessarily be fully able to accept not getting perfect scores on things, but it is really helpful sometimes on a bad day when my class just is not going the way that I want it to. Having proficiency-based grading there, knowing that I'm not just being assessed on what percentage of the tests I got. I'm being assessed on the fact that I'm working hard and I'm challenging myself and I'm trying my absolute hardest to grow as a learner, not just score well, but grow as a learner. And I think that has been a really big shift in just this past year for me having taken my first AP classes as a junior, I think that was a really, really big shift for me, being able to rely on the proficiency-based grading to recognize me as a human, not just a number as a student. And I think going off of growing as a student, um, one really interesting thing about proficiency grading is that there's, it's so, it's so flexible for students of all, on all aspects of learning, I guess. Um, for some students that find, maybe they find math to be, to come to them really easily. There's always, they can always push for a four. There's always further they can go. There's always, they can always challenge themselves. And, or if a student struggles in math, then they can push for proficient. I think it's just like a great way to acknowledge 
that you can still grow no matter how how good how confident you are in it yeah, and how well you score yes. in a traditional sense yeah yeah it's really there's so much to unpack right because you're still interacting with the traditional system right often right there are other outside requirements and maybe as a last um uh perspective on this, Lenny, can you share a little bit about the teacher side of things um, where, you know, in the system, right, they're, they're learning a new, a whole new, um, new frames, a new credential, but still also creating, even if the big picture learning um, transcript is a competency-based transcript, they're still creating that transcript in addition to um, the IBPLC. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that um, is like for staff um, as they're also learning and shifting their mindset, even in um, a model that is already trying to push like big picture learning? Um, sure. Well, I'll attempt it. Um, but that's that's a heavy lift. So <laughs> so let's if we're talking about shifting mindset, let's let's step back and look at our school. Um, yes, we're in New York State. We need 22 Carnegie credits in this variety of different classes and stuff. And we do have some what we call workshops every other day. Um, but but then we there's all this student learning that occurs at internships and during independent work time and in the community and when the community comes into our school that doesn't fit into a class. And that's why IBPLC is so wonderful because we can take these frameworks and we can look at the students holistic um, educational experience and we can actually draw out evidence, something they did with a, with a mentor, something they did as a mentor because we have peer mentors and you know students teaching students, something they did on their own, something they did for the community, something they did um, in a seat and something they did in a field. So we can draw all of that and it doesn't have to just be what happened in a class and measured in seat time. So the challenge then is, so what goes on the transcript? Well, we do, um, there, there are ways to quantify just about anything. And um, you know the, the frames do have levels. There are proficiency levels of you know, one, two, three, four, um, and five. Um, and we do struggle with um, you know, living in two worlds, um, but, we really do um, focus on the student's educational experience. And that's why these frames are excellent because it's at the students at the center. It's not um, the coursework at the center, um, but, and then, uh, you know, so if a student does an amazing um, project and they've collected data and they've, you know, um, they've done experimentation and they've done research, then we work to quantify that into a grade that could be, you know, for their their science grade at that level. Um, it does take some, you know, some work and some creativity. And in the best case, um, as our young student representatives had, is that there can actually be an exchange of ideas with the teacher and the student um, to negotiate that grade. Um, but that's, uh, I like to think that's a really small. That, that grading piece is a really small part of what we do and more of it is the focus on the student learner. Thank you so much. And I think that that's really right. That encapsulates the shift, right? How do we design around the student and their learning, not around the external decision around like the pacing and what needs to be produced and how do we um, really show that that can be done? Um, and you all are doing that. So please uh, join me in um thanking uh our great group um of panelists today ella um and peyton and andrea and jess and lenny um and and pat for being um in the background too like coming uh in the vermont team um it's been really wonderful and i we appreciate you for being here um and there's a one minute survey that should be in the chat box already um please um give us your feedback um, as I said, the slides are going to be um, in and the recording and all these additional resources um, will be shared out 